Guys, this is cool o'clock. stuff happening in cats. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Arden Moore, your host of Meowie Hour. It's presented by the Cat Fancy Association. And joining me right now in protest is pet safety cat Casey, who's one of my co-host as a feline and I bet I can get him down here right now. Rusty the performer. Hey bud. As I learned from our special guest, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Colloran, with cats, you never force, you always negotiate. And I just negotiated with Rusty the performer. So what do you think, Dr. Colloran? Did I pay attention? Good job. Absolutely. <laughs> Also at this you know, time, it's always about a, it's always about achieving detente with your cat. <laughs> I agree. Also at this time is my pleasure to introduce the co-pilots of our show. We have Kathy Black, the uh, all breed cat judge for CFA. Thank you, thank you. We also have all breed cat judge for the CFA and the editor of Cat Talk, the one and only Teresa Kiger. Um, we are very appreciative of the Cat Fancier Association for presenting this class, this class, I've been teaching all day, for this um, meow hour, and it's kind of cool, guys. Some folks are members of CFA, some people love their cats, and they want to learn how to maybe get involved more in the household cat division. I have two mutt cats, um, but today's show, we have literally a top cat in the pet world. And so we're gonna be speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. She is, I love this title, ready? Past president of, I gotta take a deep breath, American Academy of Feline Practitioners. Aren't you glad that's not their website? Their website is catvets.com. Thank you for that. She also operates and owns Chico Hospital for Cats in Chico, um, California. I want to say a big shout out. Say hi. Say hi to everybody, Dr. E. Hey. Hi, everybody. I'm really, I'm really honored that you invited me, Arden. Thanks for having me. Well, I, we, I, we think there's the a lot of you. stuff. There's a lot of stuff happening in the cat world these days in my, on the science side. So stay tuned. There's some good stuff coming. But first, we got to make you groan. So I always do something as a little icebreaker, and I have some really terrible cat jokes. Then we're going to do a trivia, and the winners are going to get an autographed copy of my Cat Behavior Answer Book. We're giving away two of them. Then we're going to have some time with Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. We will then have a breed profile on the Norwegian forest cat. Just an itty-bitty cat, right? Just kidding. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. That's the Norwegian. And that's going to be presented by Kathy Black. Um, we are then going to make, because I am a licensed bartender, we're going to make a special kitty cocktail. Do not serve this to your cats. But it's called, well, now you guys are going to know. I went to Purdue. So I am making the Purdue <laughs> Boilermaker Arden style. And uh, we can raise a glass. You can have anything, a glass of water, tea, whatever you're drinking. At the end of the show, we're going to raise our glass and we're going to toast to all cats because they just make us our lives so much better. Um, our, ne our guest next week is going to be the newly elected president of the Cat Writers Association, Paula Gregg. And she, um, she also has some pedigree cats. I think they're, aren't they, Tur what are they, Turkish? Silver, yeah. or silver Persians. Persians, silver Persians. Okay. So that's kind of what we have for the lineup. But you guys ready to groan? Come on. It's Wednesday night. We've had we, a need long a, day. we need a good groan. It's, it's hump day, women. Okay. What do kitties wear at bedtime? Uh, pajamas. Close. Paw jamas. Paw jamas. Okay. Okay. What do cats like to eat on a hot day? Here comes Rusty. <laughs> Rusty. You said food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> Mice, ice cream. Yeah. What's a, a cat's favorite movie? Um, yeah, movie? Yeah. Not cat on a hot tin roof. No, the sound of music. 
<laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of prairie. Okay. Oh, Why? man. <laughs> You know, what? Or you're really what? delivering. You're really yeah. delivering. On thank this you, thank stuff. you. Why was the cat afraid of the tree? It barked. Yeah, because of its bark. <laughs> See, look, come on, you guys are getting into it. And my personal favorite joke of cats of all time: Why don't cats play in the uh, poker in the jungle? There's too many cheetahs. <laughs> too many cheetahs? Too many cheetahs. <laughs> oh, okay, we, we, lost doc, we lost Dr. E on that one. <laughs> no, there we go. Yeah, but you know what? Oh, Laughter is good for the soul. Laughter is good for the soul, and cats are good for us. They reduce our blood pressure. They do so many things. Dr. Elizabeth Calloran is going to tell us in a minute about some of these many benefits of having a purr machine in your house. Um, but first, um, we want to, um, uh, Rusty's grabbing the treats, hang on. <laughs> There's a reason yeah, we I need to talk going. about last week's uh, right. trivia question. So here's last week's question, and then Kathy's going to name the two winners. My question was this, who is the patron saint of cats? Now, Sometimes people would think it'd be St. Francis of Assisi, but actually it's St. Gertrude. And she was in what is now Belgium. And she only lived 30 years, guys. And she was born in 1626. And she was one of these cool people that helped a lot of folks. Well, in her area, the community was getting overrun by rats and rats carry disease. So in addition to helping people that were poor and elderly, she actually started a partnership with cats and the cats helped got rid of the, the rats in her community and they named her the patron saint of cats. What do, you, do you know that story, um, Dr. Colloran? No, I've never heard that before. And she only lived to be 30, which Kathy, you say, why are, what's, the, what's the requirement to be a saint? What's, you, you either you die young or you die old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No middle-aged saints. Dang it. No, nope. Nope. You either make All a right. big splash young and you die young or you have a whole big long life of history of, <laughs> of work and sacrifice and then they want to make you a saint. So That's right. the two winners last week were chosen at random. They won uh, and, a copy of my book. And yeah. Arden says she's already mailed it. So Lisa Oshel and Mary Ann Toth, congratulations, ladies. Your book's on the way. Yep, I did media mail to save money. Okay, here's the trivia question for this week, and you will get your pause on um, that book, uh, the Cat uh, Behavior Answer Book, which just dropped on the ground because Casey, I mean, Rusty threw it down. Here you go, guys. And if you know the answer, any of you don't shout it out because they got to answer it. Okay. Besides cats, name the only two other animals who walk by moving their right leg front and back and then their left leg front and back like this. It is a distinct pacing gait that enables them to walk quieter, perhaps to sneak up on their prey because you can hear a dog but it's left, left, I mean, yeah, left, left, this, I'm, my screen is reversed, but it's one side and then the other. So here's your choices. Who are the other two species that walk like that? I see my tail right here, look at, hello, hello. Um, is it A, camels and giraffes? Is it B, elephants and rhinoceroses? Is it C, cows and horses? Or is it D, pigs and porcupines? So your choice is A, camels and giraffes, B, elephants and rhinos, C, cows and horses, or D, pigs and porcupines. Now, I know we have an exclusive, amazing veterinarian in the house. Please don't answer that question out loud. But I bet you know it. Do you know it? But you do know that cats walk left, left, right, right, right? 
Right, and that's why they have such terrific ba- ability. One of the reasons they have such a terrific bil- ability to balance. Oh. Like walking across a fence. Yeah. yeah. Except for my Siamese cat, now deceased, <laughs> who didn't read that rule. And you know how they're supposed to, you know, one foot right where the, the back foot where the other one. And he would see him walking across the ledge of the piano and he'd fall off. <laughs> Do you ever notice, though, when a cat does something clumsy? They immediately start to groom because they they pretend like it didn't happen and they want their dignity. I mean, is that true? Is that true? Yeah. My dogs would be laughing at themselves and doing it all over again. But if my cats misjudge, they're like. It's like when we fall down, we instantly look around to see who saw us fall. So (laughs) same thing for them. They automatically start grooming. All right. Now we have a very short grooming. Yeah, I should. Do something silly. Oh, wait, wait. I meant to do that. Guys, um, I know I started off with a lot of groaners and some trivia, but I'm not pussyfooting around with our special guest today. I have the utmost admiration for her. Her name is Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. She operates the Chico Hospital for Cats in Chico, California, but there's so much more to her resume. She is the past president of the American Association of Feline Practitioners. These are folks that not only go to vet school, but then they tack on certification schooling to be board certified in feline medicine. And you went to Tufts University. So years ago, we first met when I was the editor of Catnip, which sounds like a silly publication, but it is not. It is a a national magazine that is um, uh, overseen by the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. So I think we've been buddies for about 10 years, don't you think, Dr. E? Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I got to tell you guys, um, humbly, she has taught me a lot about cats, and I am use that in my pet first aid classes and behavior presentations. She and I, I actually got to stay at her house. She's lived lives in a home on a mountaintop in Chico, California with her husband. And uh, tell us about your uh, your 411 on your four-leggers. Oh, your, yeah. Oh, who are my four-leggers? Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, Opie is a year and a half old. He, he's, he got his name because he's super clumsy. <laughs> and Andy, Andy had that name when, uh, when he came to us and, and we didn't change it because it's just... It's just fine, you know, but so we have uh, uh, Mayberry RFD. Were you a Mayberry RFD fan? I'm seeing a little, some parallels. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) I was a, I was a real little kid during, in those days. But, um, and then I also have the bane of my cat's existence, which is my husband's cat, our dog, Luca, who is a Vishla. And um, they're a Hungarian bird dog. And he's got more energy than I've ever had in my life. (laughs) <laughs> and he's what 18 now no i'm kidding how old is he no he's two yeah oh he's a kid <laughs> he's, a kid. he's a kid all right so one thing yeah. i want people yeah. to know and please write this down guys and i know uh, Teresa will probably post it please go to catvets.com and also uh, chicocats.com so let's start with the the aafp the american association, association. or academy yeah, Association of Association. Feline Practitioner. So this is kind of big news that you guys have. You have a new cat-friendly certificate program. Can you tell us what that's all about? Yeah, you know, we, we have cat, had cat-friendly practice for practices for quite some time now. And it became clear to us that a lot of people worked in practices where the owners weren't supportive of that, or they worked in great big practices where it wasn't possible for them to get the skills necessary to have the whole uh, um, organization become cat friendly. So we've mm-hmm. created a, a set of um, certificates for everybody from the assistants and receptionists to the, um, to the uh, technicians, nurses and doctors to get a certificate of, from cat friendly practice and go through all the education to get that. And um, for a short time, it's free to cat friendly practices now and it will be, it's, it's a very, very affordable um, thing. And, and we're hoping that, that this is gonna 
really broaden the the skill set for people that really are really do care about how cats experience veterinary visits. I mean, it's you know, unless without the kinds of things that that we're doing, cats have a terrible time at the veterinarian, and we need to fix that. Well, let's start from really starters. Good. Help us understand the feline mind and and just how they think because. I'm sure cats everywhere are so happy you're on the show because they're like, we are not little dogs. So can you help us out on tips that we can use that sure. maybe makes that veterinary visit a little more perfect <laughs> for the, oh, uh, dear. the cat? I know it's coming. Sure. I mean, I'll tell you the things that people can do at home are so simple. Let's start with the basics. Cats are territorial animals. They are still the same cat they were 10,000 years ago. They are solitary hunters territory driven and so when anything changes in their territory they need they that is a cause of stress so instead of putting the carrier in the basement until you need to take the cat somewhere Good. leave the carrier in the living room clean it out put some nice bedding in there make it part of the home range so the cat gets to explore it and by the time you have to use it the cat will be taking naps in it because it's nice and small and warm nice. so so just just that one little thing to get the cat so acclimated to the existence of this carrier that, you know, mine live in the living room. That's where they are. They're, you know, right by a high value cat tree. They, they just, they stay there with some nice clean bedding in them and the cats can get in and out of them anytime they want to. And I throw treats in there sometimes so that they can really get comfortable with the whole notion of the carrier. So I don't get all that stress associated with getting the cat in the carrier that happens 30 minutes before you ever get to the veterinary clinic. Good. So if you do yeah, nothing like else, that. that's so it. So you're making it a kitty condo instead of a box of terror. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and people bring it up from the from the basement, you know, and the cat goes, what? It disappears. <laughs> and then, you know, then they're hunting, they're like, you know, hunting them from under the bed or in the back of a closet. And and so, you know, if you just think of a territory as a super important um, form of safety <laughs> for cats. I just dropped my ear. Oh, that's right. Um, Keep your so, ear. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's like the, the first basic thing that cat lovers can do in their own homes to make a difference. So what's some other things, especially with COVID, a lot of people are working at home. The kids are doing homework. You know, the pets, the cats don't get 17 uh, naps on a rep did a day. There's some stress going on with the kitty, isn't it? Aren't there with the COVID? I'm, Absolutely. Anytime you take a, a solitary hunter and you change the routine of the day, you know, mm -hmm. cats really like the routine. You know, they, they like novelty, of course, because they love toys and things like that, but they like their routine, gives them a sense of control, right? And cats who are solitary hunters need control so that they feel, they feel rested. They can, they, if they're, they feel as if their environment is safe, they can actually rest in it. And that's a huge part of how these cats are. So yeah, COVID has upended all of that. So one of the most important things to do in that regard is play and interacting with your cats in a really positive way because stress is a bad thing for both the cat and for, Ill for the immune suppression that causes illnesses. So mm -hmm. playing with your cat, finding ways to get, make sure the cats have privacy you know, give them a spot up in a cat tree where they can get away from everybody else anytime. There's a, a free causeway there that's unobstructed by any other animals or people. And, you know, and a place that they can safely rest and get away from all of this craziness that's going on these days. That's how you keep your cats from getting sick from being stressed out. Well, I'm laughing and not because while you were talking, my cat was having a um, dry hairball moment. Uh, Casey, but he's all back to normal. But I do know pet first aid, so I could help him until I could get him in the paws of a veterinarian like yourself. With immunosuppression, because they're stressed out, what's the consequences to their body? What's going on? What does stress do to a cat? Well, what it does, this stress does to a cat what it does to people. It creates a negative emotional state. So it creates anxiety. That anxiety isn't just a feeling. It's a physiologic cascade of hormones and other substances that basically suppress the immune system. And so what we see historically in cats, particularly we have a lot of research in cats in shelters, that if you stress out a cat, they will either 
are much more likely to catch something they've never had or wow. recrudesce or bring back an illness that they had before, particularly respiratory infections. Okay, and this is important. So in addition to COVID causing stress and making the carrier a cool kitty hangout, what's another thing that could really make a world of difference and enrich the lives of our kitties at home? I think a, an escape route, you know, okay. cats are really resource driven, right? They need, they need food. If, if you have cats that are unrelated in your house, they shouldn't be fed together. You and okay. I've talked a lot about this, Arden. Yep. Cats don't, don't like cats. They haven't known their whole life. So if you're feeding all your cats in the kitchen and they're unrelated, you're creating a stressful environment. So if you, in a stress in a stressful, so a stressful moment in a stressful environment, right? Yeah. So if you gave these cats the opportunity to eat in a place that's private and safe and to, to have water in a place that's private and safe and a place, a nice, dark, warm, quiet place to rest that they can easily get to, you're gonna be able to make, they're gonna be able to make the transition. These cat, cats are really smart and they're really, um, um, they are really adaptable, that they have to be given the opportunity to adapt. And what that means is you've got to give them the resources they need to calm down, relax, feel safe, and then they can adapt to the, the circumstances that they find themselves in. Well, when we adopted little Rusty, the performer, I'm telling you, she, he, he is the biggest chow hound in a cat's body I've ever met and gets very animated. No, 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 no. So when we get the food all ready, we have everything ready in the laundry room and we take one bowl out and it's Rusty's. We walk down the hallway to the bathroom where he's got a little place food mat, leave the light on. He gets to eat there in peace while the rest of our furry Brady Bunch, including Mikey and Casey, are eating in private little spots. And then we pick up the, the bowls and then we let out Rusty. <laughs> and you taught me that because I don't have loose stools. Well, personally, you know, that's another matter. But TMI, TMI. Or... <laughs> but my, what I'm saying is a lot of vomiting, a lot of loose stools, you know, some other things with their hair quality may be because they're stressed out at a plate at a time that should be magical meal time, right? Oh, yeah. And we know from a lot of data that's been collected by, by people that I work with, like Tony Buffington and others, that there are a whole bunch of disease states that are simply caused by a poor environmental conditions, right? So either, you know, a, a barren environment with nothing to do, you know, like living in a one bedroom apartment on the 23rd floor in a place where the two people who, other people who live there are gone for 12 hours a day. That is a barren world for a cat. Yeah. And so, so, so there's that or the, and the other ed, end of that is chaos. And, and somewhere in the middle is where these cats need to be. And, and when they're not, they can get interstitial cystitis, inflammatory bowel disease, dermatologic conditions. Um, they can develop behaviors that are inappropriate, like peeing outside the litter box or over grooming. I mean, the list of stress-related diseases in cats is probably as long as the one for, for stress-related diseases in people. And you know, the but we can fix it. Yeah, but you're, because they're both prey and predator, they're not really coming up to you and saying, I don't feel well, do they? Oh, heck no. Cats, they don't have um, the, the, um, the emotional expressiveness because they're, they aren't cooperative animals. They, don't, they didn't have any reason to develop a, a emotional co com, uh, communication skills, right? They're incredibly obtuse about their feelings because if you if you're a cat think of yourself as a as a solitary hunter and and you find a mouse yeah. well that's a that's a meal for one right so you're yeah. not going to stand up and say look at what i got <laughs> right you're going to you know, you keep super quiet about it because that's a that's a meal and the same thing for resting areas you know if you find a place that's safe away from all the predators and all that you know you're not going to go hey anybody want to join me you know, you're going to keep it really quiet and you're going to hide and you're going to stay safe, you know? So, oh so they don't have that emotional repertoire, but 
there is some stuff now in the research yeah. that, All right. that yeah. you this should know about. This is why I love you. This lady doesn't talk about things that happened 20 years ago. So you are still both a veterinarian and a student of felines, right? Oh man, I'm I'm never the same same veterinarian I was a year ago. So so there's this new thing. Have you heard about the feline grimace scale? No. Feline there grimace. Is, yeah, it's a feline grimace scale. And it's basically a way of evaluating acute pain in cats by facial expression. Wow. And okay. they, it's, it's completely validated. You can learn how to do it. It's, it's something that we're going to be teaching nurses and veterinarians how to do because they now know the, the different ways in which cats manifest pain in their ear position, their, the position of their head and their body, the, the wow. way their whiskers are the way their eyes are, look. I mean, it is just the coolest thing because, because cats are very emotional. It's just that we don't know how to read them. So now we're learning. So it's now, a very uh, subtle thing that you need to look for, obviously, because cats can hide and mask their pain. But if you can oh, recognize those symptoms of different, different ways that the face looks, maybe you can kind of key on what's going on. Can yeah, you give us an example of like, what is a cat that may be in a lot of pain based on a few facial cues? There's, you, there's a, it's fee, I think it's the website is felinegrimacescale.com. I'm going to check it out. And it is validated. This is not like, oh, just look for these ear, this ear position. It's okay. like a scoring system that is completely validated and it's been validated across observers so so people once they're taught it if if one person sees a painful condition in a cat and if every other trained observer sees the same thing so wow. it's awesome yeah awesome. now it's big one thing i want to ask is kathy um and Teresa are all breed cat judges and is there any tips you can give some of our viewers that may be in cat shows, they have these beautiful cats and how to keep the cats feeling safe and secure and not scared. Oh man, well, you know, people who show cats know this stuff. I mean, they, <laughs> you know, I, I go to cat shows, you know, and I watch them do the things that I would be doing. They are brushing them, they're giving them treats, they're keeping their, their visual stimulus as much under control as possible. You see a lot of these carriers, have three sides that are closed off. So, so the visual cues are, are blocked. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest stimulus for cats is their noses, right? So, so keeping those odors under control. I, I watch cat breeders when I go to cat shows, man, they know this stuff. You know, they know how cats experience the world and it's not the same way that we do. You know, that's why cats talk to us. They don't talk to the, each other. They don't have to talk to each other because they communicate in so many different ways. They have to talk to us because we're not observant. We just right. like, Casey, like Casey just agreed, right, Casey? No, yeah, no, Arden, I would I would say that probably it's not cat shows that breeders have to lower the stress in their animals. It's at home because most breeders have quite a few cats. Oh. I mean, obviously, and usually you have to keep your males separated because they're males, you know, okay. and you have, and so they're not able to interact in the household on a full-time basis like you would a neuter or a spay. So that was a challenge I always had as a breeder was how to make sure that my cats were healthy and reduce the stress because they did have to live isolated times and some of them like to be isolated, you know, <laughs> rather than being thrown together with others. Yeah. But you had to, that they had a limited environment that they had to live in, so you had to make sure that, that was uh, properly stimulating and clean and and enough room, and you know, and things like that. So those are the more the stress levels that I consider if I'm thinking of a breeding program because you mm -hmm. have multiple animals that you have to keep in a confined space. And they're not able to have that ability to go find a place to run and hide or go find that nice, you know, sunny spot on the on the west window when they only get east window sun, you know, different things like that. Is there any a little tip you can offer some of the folks? Because you do want to keep breeds healthy and restore the breeds. And there's not a lot of cat breeds when you come compare them to dogs, Dr. Calloran. No, that's for sure. But and all and cat personalities are different. So what one cat needs, another cat it just shrugs his shoulder at, right? So, mm -hmm. so right. It, it is also personality driven, right? So some cats really love to interact with humans, and and other other cats haven't been as well socialized to humans and things like that. But but you know, there's a 
so much knowledge now around um, the emotional the emotional state of cats and the importance that it ha has that a lot has been written about um, the understanding the individual cat's needs and, and meeting them even if they're in a circumstance that is not ideal. So we even have some made some major changes in shelters, you know, okay. where, where pe people don't, you know, if, if, if the cats, don't, cats don't like to be, don't like strangers, right? And so they don't, we know not to make direct eye contact with cats. Staring is a threat, you know, so you don't stare at cats. You, you, you know, and you keep, keep, keep strangers away and cats don't like other cats they haven't known their whole lives. So you make sure they can't see one another. You know, those are the kinds of things that, that are really important. I just visited a cat breeder um, not, not too long ago and, and he had had so many toys and so many cat trees. So he had all the same problems. He was, he had the toms out in, out in the build, building out off the property. He, and there was cat trees and cat perches and, and tr toys and all that kind of stuff. And, and that was what he did almost all day long. Thank God he was retired. You know, and he would go out and he wash up and play with the cats, you know, and, and, um, but he, he really worked at keeping them, the ones that were, had to be separate, particularly the Toms, sort of engaged in regular social life, you know, and that's super important. Well, we, you know, you talk about catvets.com and I really want people to go to that site. It has a lot of great information from people who are board certified in feline medicine. Um, I'm looking at Casey right now. Do you think Casey, here's, here's another one. Can I give you another? Yeah. Uh, he looks fabulous. So here's the other one. There is a, a, a client or cat owner facing website called catfriendly.com. Okay. And that website, that website is completely curated by people like me. Good. So instead of going to Dr. Google for information about how to <laughs> feed a cat and all that crap, so sorry. And hey, it's you, meowing you hour. <laughs> I haven't had a drink yet either. Um, so at catfriendly.com, that, that stuff is all curated by feline veterinarians so you can be sure that you're getting really good information on a wide variety of and it's written in a language it's not written in medical me, medical ease it's written in English for people normal people to look at so catfriendly.com is a really good place to go and I appreciate it and I know uh, uh, Teresa is going to post that on our, our chat part what what got you into being uh, a feline practitioner because um, I know you have a dog in the house so what is it now that said you know what when I become a veterinarian I, I want to focus on feline medicine actually I was a general practitioner for a few years after my in I did an internship and did, did, went into general practice for a while and I got I, I'm a, everybody has a different sort of way they think comfortably. And, and for me, knowing a whole lot about a very broad, narrow band of stuff wasn't nearly as exciting and interesting for me as having a depth of knowledge about one thing. Okay, good. So, so I, when I went, got my master's, I, this was in 1996. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you. I'm really old. Okay, um, nice. Anyway, that. <laughs> The, uh, so 1996, I got my master's degree. This was after vet school. And I did my, um, my master's thesis on the California mountain lion. Oh, wow. Um, and it was, it was about public policy around, around the mountain lion. And I just was enchanted by the science of feline medicine. I just, I couldn't get enough of it. So I came back after I did that and said, that's it. I joined the AFP started attending every shred of feline medicine I could, I could attend. And it just, that was the end of it. End of me, man. I was, I was never going to be a dog guy again. Well, being a cat veterinarian, and I know there's a real rise in the number of pet sitters that are now specializing in cat only care. What's, what's oh, the wow. state of, what's the state of uh, cats in 2020? Oh man. Well, I'll tell <laughs> you're going to, this is really amazing. One of the things that in my practice, we used to see, we used to think it was a pretty good to see about 40 new clients a month. We're a university town, you know, and so we have yes. a little bit of a revolving door. COVID happens and we are seeing somewhere between 85 and 115 new clients a month. Whoa. Wow. Why is that you ask? Yeah. Well, there are a couple reasons. One of them is we are seeing way more kittens and young cats than we have ever seen before. Really? People are saying, I am lonely. 
I am going to go adopt a cat and I'm going to learn how to take care of it. And so we're seeing tons and tons of new clients with new adoptions. That's fantastic. The shelters are, yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, the shelters, shelters, I mean, we had a lady on a previous show and they were talking about how they had no cats in their shelters and they were having to import cats from other regions just to get cats in their shelters because the shelters have been emptied out, which is one of the blessings that we can say happened during the COVID era. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the other, here's the other blessing. Okay. I like silver linings. (laughs) <laughs> we were talking a little bit earlier about how obtuse and, and hard to read cats are. Well, now people are at home and they're watching their cats and they're right. seeing stuff. So we're seeing illnesses earlier in the cycle than we nice. would have otherwise. Because people are going, you know, if I hadn't been working, you know, 10 hours in my, in my own house instead of out at my office, I never would have noticed this. And they're bringing us stuff and we're catching stuff early. So, um, so that's the other cool thing that's happening. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing, and we've got a question from Barbara Yeager. She said, how are you handling COVID-19 in your practice, the Chico Hospital for Cats, which is in Chico, California, um, the, for your staff and yourself to keep you guys safe so you can give good care for cats? Well, we have, you know, we got it down now. You know, we closed down in March. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we closed down in March. We've been doing this a while now. We have, um, we all, because we cannot social distance and, and do our work. We have to wear masks every minute of every day. Um, we, we try to maintain when we can social distancing. We have not let clients into the building since March. Um, you know, we meet them outside. We ask them to put the carrier by the back door and go back to their car so that we're, you know, we can maintain social distance. If somebody shows up without a mask, we give them one. You know, it's it's just that. And know, I really you know, hate the, the not having the interaction with my vet while they're examining oh, my, my animal. Boy. I really miss that. It is, I do too. I love my my clients and I love the relationships that I have with them. And so what, I, what I've been doing um, ever since, and it's starting to get a little hard to do it now because it's starting to get pretty cold and rainy and stuff. But yeah. up until now, I go out to the parking lot. I go out and talk to them because I just can't not. I have to. It's, I just got to go connect with them. I got to talk to them about their cats in person as much as I can and, because it's just it's so critical for me to get connected with them so that we can come make good decisions. Now you um, you had me on a podcast. You and your vet technician Samet, tell me, uh, is there something people can tune in to hear from you? Sure, we have. We're on Spotify and Apple Apple Play and all the rest of that. And you can go to our website. Um, there, are, the podcasts are all there, and or you can just subscribe, and you'll get get a new one every couple of weeks. We have some really fun ones and, and some funny ones and some serious ones too. We do I-131, which is a radiation treatment for hyperthyroidism. And so that's a, we did a huge podcast about that because people don't know very much about it. And it's a cure instead of a management tool. And so it's an important new piece of, of service that we can do for people. And, but there's a bunch of them. For, we interview shelter people. We had Arden on. We, we got, you know. <laughs> We're going to yeah, get our. Sorry back. about that. I can't believe you had no, me on. That was, that was way fun. We got a good, uh, we got we a really another good question. Too. Yeah, we've had oh, another just, question about yeah. early spay neuter. Has there any, been any, any updates about early spay neutering, uh, whether you should or shouldn't? I mean, I know people think about it differently for like a show cat because you want the head to broaden or, you know, something like that within the breeds. Mm-hmm. But, and a lot of vets won't do it unless they're a certain weight or a certain age. But I was just curious if there's any new update on that procedure, either positive or negative? There hasn't been any negative data about early spay and neuter, to be, to be honest. There hasn't been a lot of, of negative stuff about it. Now, in shelters, it's different. You know, in my practice, because um, these cats are in homes already and they're being cared for and loved, I get to wait. And the safety of that is that cats don't thermoregulate very well until later on in their lives. And they also need energy more frequently when they're really little, they need to be, they can't be fasted, right? And so, so I can wait because these are beloved cats in homes. In shelters, that doesn't happen. And so early spay neuter is an important tool for, for overpopulation. And the data that I've seen in 
Now there, it's different in dogs and, and I can't even begin to comment on that, but early spay and neuter in cats does not appear to have any negative consequences. Okay, well, that was a really good question. Good question. The other question yeah. I have for you is, um, when I went to your uh, Chico Hospital for Cats a couple of two, three years ago, um, I got to spend time with you and your team to learn more about cats to be able to do a better job of teaching pet first aid. And since then, we actually teach cat only first aid classes in addition to That's my awesome. others, which is really cool. But my question for you is um, with um, the Chico Hospital for Cats, you've been challenged. Sure, we're dealing with COVID now, but can you tell our, our folks at Meowie Hour what happened when you had the wildfire come by, the Paradise Fire? Oh man, that was um, actually two years ago this month. Um, th it was a wildfire that sped through a town and basically destroyed it. And it was the, more people died in that wild, wildfire than any other in history. There 86 people were dead as a result of it. And, and 25,000 people had to evacuate. So, and they all- Including many of your staff, like, like Sam, right? Sam lost his house. Yeah. yeah. Sam, Sam, three of my staff members lost their homes. Um, we were evacuated. I lived in the upstairs for a while. We became a shelter. We became an emergency shelter. I had 66 cats for <laughs> anywhere from one to, one to four months. Um, now, but here's the power of cat-friendly practice, Arden. Okay, all right. All of those cats ate, all of those cats went home with no health problems. And oh, that was because what we were talking about earlier is we know how to keep stress at bay. You know, all, none of these cats ever saw a strange cat. They were fed separately. They were fed by the same people. They were handled gently. There wasn't a lot of noise. Nobody talked loudly. I mean, that is the power. When you talk about 66 straight, and now these cats came with nothing. You know, these people fled for their lives. There was, they had no medications that they might've needed. They had no special food. We just fed them what we had, right? And, um, and they still, all of them went home healthy to their home, to their owners. That's, so that's the power. For the paw. Guys, we're speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. She is a veterinarian and the owner of Chico Hospital for Cats. I hope you go to chicocats.com as well. And if you're lucky enough to live in that area, you better have her as your vet for uh, a cat care. And um, is there any parting message? And I hope you stick around, but we're going to be learning about the Norwegian. Is there any other parting message you want to give us about cats? I've just learned a ton. I don't know about you, Kathy. What do you think? Have you learned? Any, she's awesome. I told you she's awesome. <laughs> any other questions for you, Kathy? Anything, anything yeah. coming across the board there? Uh, uh, there's been a couple of different topics, but I think everyone's been very excited about the information you've given them and especially the websites. And I think that, that you know, instead of Googling something, I love that website you were talking about for yeah, pet certainly. owners. So when we place our kittens with a new pet owner, we can say, hey, if you can't get a hold of me to answer your question, go check this out. It's got veterinarian approval. Yeah. So that's great. Great. Awesome. All right. Um, at this time, I really thank you. I miss you. Um, I got to stay at your house. Your husband is an amazing cook, chef, and uh, tell him I said hi. And, I will. Um, He's making me salmon tonight. Oh, man. We're all coming to her house. And then uh, I'll be there in a few hours. Yes. <laughs> okay. and stick around because uh, at this time, sure. I would love for all of us to learn more about the Norwegian forest cat and who better than an all cat breed judge, Kathy Black. So take it away, Kathy. My turn oh. to learn something. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the Norwegian forest cat. And I can't pronounce it in Norwegian, but it's also called the Skog Cat, or Skog Cat. Uh, but it's a native cat of Norway. And it's a semi-long-haired cat that's very rugged, and so it fits its name. The Norwegians, uh, people oftentimes try to associate their random bred cat with a pedigreed cat. And of course, the Maine Coon is our naturally occurring long hair cat of North America, probably got its ancestry from the Norwegian cats that were on the Viking ships when they came over and docked over here in the Americas. But I have this picture up to show you the differences. There's three major differences between a Maine Coon and a Norwegian forest cat. The first one is the head shape. The head shape on a Maine Coon is more of a square 
with a squared muzzle, and the Norwegian has a beautiful triangle-shaped face. So you can see that in this illustration here. They also have different shaped eyes. The Maine Coons have a more rounded eye set into those cheekbones, and the Norwegian has an almond shape to the eye. And they have a very difference in the profile. You can't see the profile here, but a Maine Coon has a nice gentle curve, a concave curve to the profile. And a Norwegian has a very razor straight profile, which we can see in, in some other pictures. The other big difference is the coat. The Norwegian forest cat have a very waterproof double coat. And if you've ever tried to bathe and blow dry a Norwegian, you know what I'm talking about. They're impossible to get wet. And then once you get them wet, they're impossible to get dry. So uh, they they don't take any extra grooming than you would for any other semi-shaggy, long-haired cat, uh, except during their seasonal shed. But they do have that nice waterproof coat that's designed to help them live in Norway, in the winters of Norway. So they have this big, full ruff that we call this the ruff. They have the britches back here on the back hocks. Uh, they're a sturdy boned uh, cat. And they come in multiple colors, but probably brown tabby and white is the most popular color. But they come in all colors and patterns except those associated with the Siamese. So no seal point, chocolate point, blue point, nothing on the color restriction uh, gene. But any other color is, is a go, okay? Now here's just some of the pictures I showed, I grabbed off people's Facebook pages <laughs> and off the internet. Um, you can really see the beautiful triangle shape on this lovely female. And even the little baby, which babies don't always show you their proper head structure so they get a little older. But even this little baby's already got a nice triangular shaped head. You can see it on these two guys right here. And here's that very nice straight profile on this left-hand picture that I was talking about. Some of the colors that they come in, here's a brown patch tabby in white, here's a red tabby in white, here's a brown tabby, brown tabby in white. Um, not exactly what this is. We'll call it a brown tabby. Um, here's a black and white or a dark blue and white. So they come in all different kinds of colors and you can really see that beautiful triangle shaped head on this guy. And this was a litter of kittens that I grabbed off a, a lady's Facebook page. I just thought it was so precious. I always think the Norwegians all look like girls because they have a very sweet, uh, very sweet looking expression because of that triangle shape to the head and those almond eye shape. And even though these are not all females, I know this one is because she's a brown patch tabby. Um, but to me, Norwegians always look like girls. And that is the end of my presentation. Wow. Hey, uh, Dr. Cowran, I did not know the triangle face versus the, uh, you know, more of a square face on a Maine Coon. But what do you think of that presentation? That was awesome. I learned stuff. That's oh. neat. You just well, helped thank me. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, my cat, uh, Rusty, has the almond shape, and Casey has the the round eyes. So that's pretty cool. And to go, I know there's a lot of virtual cat shows going on for safety reasons. Um, please, guys, go to the CFA, the Cat Fancier Association Facebook page. Find out what's going on in your neck of the woods. Briefly, Kathy, can you give any guidance for people? that want to learn more about a cat show, but they can't go in person. But what can we do? Because I want to right. educate folks. Yeah, right now the shows are not allowing spectators and we are having shows again. We had our first live show last weekend. We got one coming up in Kansas City uh, the day after Thanksgiving. And there's some other ones planned up in the Ohio. I think Pittsburgh has one planned, uh, and Houston in January and a couple in December. So we're starting to try to have shows again, but you know, the COVID's really re rearing its ugly head right now. And so yeah. those are all subject to changing to local laws. But in the meantime, you can always either enter your cat or um, go and vote for your favorite cat out of the virtual cat shows. And if you go to CFA.org and you look at the schedule, it actually shows you the different virtual shows that are going on in addition to the live shows that are planned. Like I said, we're not ex allowing any spectators 
So, but you can exhibit your cat at a show if you got one coming up near you. And so and be sure and check out the virtual yeah. shows. Talk about these. Casey and Rusty are proud card holding felines for the CCW. So I right. love that CFA is recognizing all cats. And you know what, Dr. Uh, e, you might get Andy and Opie as members of the household cat. Tell them, tell her. Tell That's her right. I didn't know about that. Yeah. So, really so cool. we, have a, we have a new program to recognize the non pedigreed cats. It's called Companion Cat World. CCW, and when you register your cat for a one-time fee of $13, your cat goes up in our gallery of cats on the CFA website. It gets a special registration number in our database that's been going on since 1906, and you also get a picture, a card with your cat's picture on it, your cat's information, and your information. You can also get luggage tags. If you want to put a luggage tag on your crate, which is great when it goes to the vet, so the vet knows which crate yeah. belongs to which cat and it has That's your awesome. cat's picture on it and so uh, just one time fee for $13 per they cat. Got, they got yeah. discounts for different things so I think Opie and Andy are asking you for Christmas maybe to I let them be card carrying members of the it's CCW. It's the holiday season man. Yeah, why not? So go to cfa.org slash ccw and get them registered today. Hey, um, can you pull up the uh, first aid pick if you wouldn't mind? You bet. Thank you. And Kathy, thank you for that. Um, I love learning about the Norwegian. She did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So guys, you've seen this. Um, I love teaching pet first aid. I teach it on different levels. Everything is veterinary approved. So um, in addition to a two-day instructor program, which I just finished today, teaching people to become instructors, I do teach a cat and dog first aid. It's four and a half hours. The next one is uh, December uh, 12th. But for all you CFW and CAT fans, we have a cat only first aid CPR class, three hours. The last one of 2020 done interactive live with Zoom. And it's going to be December um, 13th from 11 to 2 Central Time. And look who my assistants are. I got pet safety cat Casey and Rusty, the performer. What I love about this, just like Dr. Collarin was talking about, you can go and push that out, is um, I get to show on my cats how to do things, but because you're stuck at home with COVID, you get to work on your own cats who feel safer at home to do it at the same thing. So Dr. Collarin, what do you think about a cat first aid class? Am I, am I hitting the mark? I think... Listen, I think that sometimes, you know, it just, especially now, it take, it can be a real challenge to get your cat to the vet. And so if you can do some things to make it safe and stable, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I tell people that first aid is, is that life-saving bridge between the uh-oh and getting to the veterinary clinic. So we are not going to replace you, I promise. But I think sometimes oh, no. minutes matter and having a knowledge of what to do and what not to do to safely get aid and stabilize is key though. And I think you're off the, the uh, video. So let's see your face again. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Don't hide. There's nowhere to hide on Meowie Hour. <laughs> nowhere to hide. <laughs> nowhere to run. Nowhere to hide. But I, I don't know. I do. saw someone walking around. She might have had like a naked man behind her or something. Oh, oh he was just setting the fire. Yeah, I did see it. He's making a lot of noise. So I wonder if he's going to go away from <laughs> Well, I got to say, you're one of my uh, go-to advisors for first aid. And one of the best things we teach people is how to towel wrap and put a cat in a carrier top side and leave the, 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 the towel in. But can you tell us about the wrong way and the right way to grab a cat in a carrier so they don't get motion sickness and hissed off? Oh, you know, the, well, there's, you know, the first thing you should never do is carry it by the handle on the top. Why rock the boat? <laughs> uh oh, I think we because lost her. Like this, right? And and then it's you know, and I I used to do this all the time before I started doing this. I used to bang it against the door jam going in the room, right? And it just bang it around and make a big noise. So you just want to have, and you can cover it with a towel to reduce the uh, visual stimulation and reduce some of the auditory stimulation, and um, give them a nice dark place to feel safe. And then what we teach people 
in, in the veterinary setting, and it works at home too, is to not pull the cat out of the carrier. Take the carrier apart. If yeah. you have a top loader, that's great. But if you don't, you just take the carrier apart, take all those little screws out all the way around <laughs> and hold, hold the door because if you don't, it'll land on the floor and make big bad noise. And then, and so the cat then doesn't have to get pulled out of the carrier or shaken out of the carrier. We used to call that the martini. We used to call that the martini shaker. I saw a new thing advertised where it's like a drawer, like a filing cabinet drawer, and you can actually pull it out. I had never seen one in person yep. before. Now I prefer soft-sided carriers because you don't have to worry about the big bulkiness of it, and they're easier to throw over your shoulder and carry, so the cat's yeah, up against your hip. I can. But. I promise you, your. I, I promise you, your veterinarian does not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other thing is you taught me that when you are transporting your cat in a carrier, where is the best place in the car to have that cat carrier? On the floorboards behind the passenger seat, not in the back seat strapped in. And the reason we know that is Subaru, thank the Lord, they're what a good company they are. Yeah. They did crash test dummies with carriers and cats and proved that the safest place was behind the passenger seat on the floor. There you go. There you go. You heard it from the good doctor, Dr. Elizabeth Colloran. Uh, at this time, it's time for Kitty Cocktail Hour. I'm going to joke around a little bit, but I went to college and graduated from Purdue University um, in 19... And uh, so in homage to my alma mater, um, I am creating today real easy the Purdue Boilermaker Arden style. And it will salute uh, your favorite uh, uh, college, if you would, and it's football season, whether there's people in the, in the stands or not. Um, I also want to give a big shout out and pause up to Teresa Kiger right here. She creates those recipe cocktail graphics every time and she got my black and gold in. Thank you, Teresa. Wow. We ain't ladies. <laughs> it's very easy, guys. We got a regular, you can get your favorite beer glass, or this one has no sweating. You grab your favorite beer. All right, don't laugh. I have weenie beers. I don't do dark, dark beers, but your favorite. And, oh, didn't that sound good? And then you um, pour it in your uh, beer glass try not to have a big, a lot of foam. So curving it like this. This is one of the simpler cocktails I've made, but it gets more fun now. Jägermeister, yeah, good. Um, you take Jägermeister and you pour it in your favorite shot glass. Can you tell us what that is? Cause I'm not familiar with it. Oh, um, Jägermeister is, um, Really, really heavy duty. Um, I'm gonna freak out here. It's um, it's like it's like a whiskey, but it's got some botanical blends in it. And all I know is when I was 30 years old, I drank Coke Mitt, which is M I T, with Jägermeister. And um, it's a it's a it's kind of a, a botanical a liqueur with a punch. So um, just to let you know at Oktoberfest in uh, in Germany. Um, I don't remember most of it after I had Jägermeister met Cola. It's pretty potent. So you take your shot, you take your glass, you drop it in. So now I want all of us to raise a glass. And at this time, let us toast to all those cool cats, those fine felines, their cute kittens, who are making us so much better as humans. Cheers. 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 Go Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do very well in sports now, but um, we uh, I think we're two and one this football season, which is better than most years. But what do you think of my drink, Dr. E? I think if I if I drank it, I would spend a, probably a week in bed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So um, just to let you know, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Elizabeth Collarant. We really learned a lot, and I love you. You're a great person. Cats are better off because you're on this planet. So thank you for being our special guest. 
Thanks for having me. It was an honor to be here. And I love meeting your some new friends. It was These great. are our co-pilots. They know their stuff. And Kathy and Teresa, thank you again. I think this was one of our best, best shows. What do you think? Yeah. I we think learned a lot. Really good. Remind That's us really again who we have next week. Next week, we have the newly elected president of the Cat Writers Association. We're talking about the very nice, very sweet, very nose cats, Paula Gregg. And I think it's Persians she raises, but it's silky Persians. Is that the right term? Silver Persians. Silver Persians. Two silver Persians. Trump okay. Relay. All right. So she's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to learn about uh, them and what she has in store for the Cat Writers Association. I've been a member of that for 20 years. And uh, until uh, next time, oh, this, this show, guys, check it out. It's on YouTube Meowie Hour later tonight, thanks to Kathy Black. So you can share it with your mm -hmm. friends. Get a bunch of people there to, to tune in for next week. So same cat channel, same cat time. We'll see you on Meowie Hour. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Uh -huh.